Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here. This morning, we're back in the book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning in verse 28 and concluding in verse 28. That's right. The pastor took a day off and is just doing one verse. So you guys will be out of here in no time. <laughs> Romans 8.28. Why don't you guys read it with me? What then shall we say to these things? Never mind. Is that the right slide? It should say Romans 8.28. Okay. The guy who makes these slides is not a professional. So forgive me. And let's pray. Father, I thank you that all things work together for those that love you and are the called according to your purpose. Lord, this precious truth that many of us have memorized, I pray that you help us to understand the depth of it the extent of it and the neglect of it that we might apply your truths to our lives. I am just awestruck at how you use everything and that you are for us. That even when I fall and even in my sin that you use that for your glory. And I pray that you help us to understand more of that. Obviously we can't understand all of it, but help us to understand more of it today. Lord, you know our hearts, the things we struggle with, the things that anchor us to this world, and I pray that you'd free us this morning as we look into your word, that it might cleanse our heart and renew our minds for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, this slide I made when I thought I would get through 31 verses. And uh, it ain't going to happen. So we're just going to do chapter 8, verse 28. So this is where we are. We're finishing up in the next couple weeks, chapter 8 of Romans. Basically, the gospel according to Paul as he goes through. Let's read. And we know now that all things work together for good. For those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these also justified. And whom he justified, these also he glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall, we, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, who is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. I thought I was going to do all those verses. And I'm just going to do the one. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. That just sounds so very Pollyanna, doesn't it? Like it's all good. You know, I could punch myself in the face, hit myself with a hammer, and God's going to use that. There's some good in that somewhere. It's not an excuse to be willful and idiotic. It's a promise that God works through all things, everything, failures, disappointments, difficulties, death. He works all these things out for his purposes. And I think the big problem that we have about that is God's sovereignty, that he made everything for himself. 
We weren't made for ourselves. You know, Self Magazine would tell you otherwise, but God did not create you for yourself. He created you for him. And if he created us for him, then we should be at his disposal 24 seven, amen? So the passage is that God works all things together for good, even bad things, even horrific things, even uh, things that we don't even wanna talk about. Is it really true? Could it be true that God works all those things together? Is it true that God is truly sovereign? And that's really the question. Is God really the boss? Or has evil seized his kingdom and is just running us all ragged and God is completely without help to stop it? And you know that's the way some people think of God. He's an anemic sort of passive, kind of created everything, spun everything to existence, then went on a vacation kind of God. And it's not that way at all. He works all things together for good. Because when I turn on the TV and I see the creepy stuff that's going on with the election and I see people saying and doing the most ungodly, immoral things, God is working all things out for good. So why do I get so freaked out? Too much TV. But the passage seems so Pollyanna, and if you don't know that term, it's, it's taken from a book that was written and uh, was made into a movie by Disney in uh, the 1960s and uh, starring Haley Mills. And she's a, an orphan who comes to a town. She's an orphan of two, her parents were missionaries and they were killed. And so she was sent to live with her Aunt Polly, who she's named after. And Polly is this tough old broad, <laughs> like Mary Dixon. <laughs> I used to call her tough old broad all the time. So this is, I, I, I'm not worried about getting back to her. <laughs> but she was this tough old broad who ran everything. She told the pastor what he would preach, told the town what they would do and what they wouldn't do. And it all was based on her because she was wealthy. Well, now she's faced with this orphan to come live with her. And of course, she's not dressed right. She doesn't think right. She doesn't talk right. She doesn't walk right. There's nothing about her that's right as far as she's concerned. She puts her up on the upper floor of her gigantic mansion, puts her in a dusty old attic. And Pollyanna is thrilled. She goes, thank you for putting up me up here because what a view I have. <laughs> and it's like you cannot get this girl to complain because she has a game that she likes to play that her dad taught her, which is called the glad game. I thought maybe you guys would know it. The glad game. And she invented it one Christmas when they were as missionaries and something came for her as a gift for Christmas and she was hoping for a doll. And what she did when she opened it up, she found out it was a pair of crutches. And so she made up this game that there's something to be glad about the crutches. And she said, I should be glad that I don't need the crutches. And so she did. And you see, she looked at everything as it working to good because she played the glad game. She was always, always, always looking for something to be thankful for. And uh, for, for that reason, it's one of my favorite movies. I would recommend it. Um, there's... There's a young boy who's skinny dipping in the very beginning and he swings on a rope and you see his entire naked backside. But other than that, <laughs> so there is nakedness in this thing that I'm telling you. So just shield your eyes if you have a problem with young boys behinds. <laughs> but she meets the pastor and the pastor is Carl Malden, the actor, and he is a fire and brimstone angry preacher. And he is telling everybody in his congregation what sinners they are and how they're going to go to hell. And the people dread Sunday, although out of duty, they all go and they dress in their finest clothes and then sweat all over them. And, you know, he's pounding on the pulpit and, and the chandelier is shaking. And Pollyanna's like, this is different. And, and Aunt Polly is sitting there just looking so prim and proper because he is saying everything that she told him to say. 
because her father was a great pastor. And she basically is saying that there's always something to be glad for. And she meets Carl Malden privately, which is always the best thing if you're going to have a conversation. And she very whimsically has a conversation with him. And she asks the question, do you like being a pastor? Because it doesn't seem like you like it. She goes, my father was a pastor. Or he was a missionary. And so he becomes interested in her experience because he's a guy who just is always led by the nose by a woman, no matter what her age. And he begins, she begins to tell him about all the happy passages in the scriptures, you know, like being thankful and blessing the Lord and all those things. And she actually knows exactly how many of them there are because she counted them. And she informs Carl Malden that that's kind of the way my father was, you know, he stuck more to those things, you know? And, uh, so that begins Carl Malden thinking, and as he begins looking through the scriptures, he sees that there are all of those kind of passages. All of the people come out of church and they sit around and they go, oh my goodness, what a sermon that was. I could hardly wait to get out of there. I was squirming in my seat, you know, because they're all sinners. They're, they all know they're sinners. And he's basically yelling and screaming at them the entire service. And one of the, one of the really sour people says, hey, little Miss Sunshine, come over here. Could you find anything good about that? Is there something good in it? And she was thinking, she's thinking, and she goes, it'll be another seven whole days till we have to come back. <laughs> and so she found the good in it, and, and that's the glad game, essentially, which I think is tying into this passage ex exceptionally well. And I'm not sure that we know how to do this very well. She meets a woman who is obsessed with her death and she lays in bed and the doctors give her pills and they t this tells her, you know, she's, she's on her way out and she's shopping for the interior of her coffin and scratching her head and wondering what colors and, you know, all different patterns and, she, and what kind of coffin and, and spending tons of money on preparing for the day that's coming long into the future. But she's given up on life. And Pollyanna comes into her, into her room and is amazed that she spends all this time obsessing on death. And she has no life. And so she rebukes her sharply because this woman needed it. And it snapped her out of it and she ends up starting living her life. She actually leaves the house and she starts to forget about those things and making an investment in her death and that being her only mission in life. It's just such a great movie. She goes and finds a man who's locked up inside of his house and he won't go out. He won't see anybody. And he's got, you know, private property signs up and nobody's allowed in. And there's this young orphan boy she befriends who sneaks in and likes to climb the tree because it's the biggest tree in all the town. And so he has to climb it. But this man, Mr. Pendergast, comes out with a gun and he captures him and pulls him into the... He doesn't know what to do with him once he gets him because he can't bring him outside because he doesn't go outside. And Pollyanna goes in and defends this young boy and starts talking to this man and just walks into his house and starts helping herself to sit down and walk around and have a conversation. And, and he's like, get out of here. This is my private property. These are private things. Don't touch them. And she, she sees a little prism on the wall and she goes, what is that? Said, That's it's fragmented light, don't you know this? You know, and he starts explaining to her how crystals take light and make it into a prism. And, you know, and she goes, that is so pretty. You know, and he's trying to get into the whole science of it. And she's just admiring the, the beauty of the colors. And so she befriends this guy, his, so his heart softens, and they start taking all of the crystals off all the various things in the house and hanging them up by the window. And the whole house is now glittering with rainbows and his life begins to change. She didn't see this guy, somebody to be avoided. She didn't see this other woman as somebody to just stay out of her way. She didn't even see her, her aunt as somebody that she should avoid entirely, but she brought a fresh perspective and she brought love. And if I don't stretch it too far, it's because of this verse. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. And it doesn't matter who you are, 
there's a purpose in whatever it is that you're going through, if you know the Lord. If you don't know the Lord, you have no such guarantee. But if you do know the Lord, there's a purpose in everything. And I began to start checking off things in my life that I didn't care for and didn't like and I thought were, and I got to see that there was a purpose in all of them. But it's only because I asked the Lord, why? Why this? Why me? Why now? You guys ask those questions? There's a way to ask that question where you're making an accusation. And then there's a way to ask that question where you truly want an answer. Well, let's get into the passage. First of all, this verse has everything to do with God's sovereignty, that he controls everything, that everything is in his control. There's nothing that escapes his notice. There's nothing that goes secret under the radar. It says here in Psalm 115.3, but our God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. And you know, some people are very uncomfortable with that. Well, as a parent, don't you think you could do whatever you want with your kids? That's what bothers me when I see bad parenting. It's not my job. It's your job. But you're doing a terrible job of it. Now, if somebody's being hurt or thrashed or something of that nature, or somebody's out of control, I will get involved. But it's their kid. And that bothers me that they have control and I don't. Same thing with the sovereignty of God. I have trouble that he's in control. He could pull the plug on my heart at any moment, boo, and I just fall in a heap. I don't like that idea because I don't have control. The following verses are going to talk about predestination and election and all of these things, which talk of God's sovereignty, which makes a lot of people uncomfortable as well. But we'll talk about that next week. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. It says in Ephesians 1, verses 9 to 11, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Notice that God's will is purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him or into him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God does what he wants. He works everything out in accordance with his own will. That's like working everything together for good for those who love the Lord. You can be sure that God's number one priority is for his glorification. And number two is for your edification if you know Christ. Those are his two priorities. That's why Jesus came, for you. So that he might be seen as who he truly is, a loving father. In Psalm 119, verses 89 to 91, it says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. You continue this day according to your ordinances for all your servants. All are your servants. Everyone is God's servant. The, everything is God's. Everything. This house, your car, your bank account, your cell phone, your computer. Everything is here to serve God. And if it doesn't, we know what that's called. It's called sin. But everything is his. He created it all. He has a right to it. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has made all for himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. God has created all things for himself, including evil people he has created for himself, but they ultimately will have a place. I don't know about you, but I, I sometimes wonder, God, why, did, why do you let this person <laughs> in the White House in the governor's house, in the, in the church. <laughs> Everyone is here to serve him. Everyone is his servant. Everything is his. And we need to remember that. It's not mine. If it doesn't go according to my plan, then I got to figure out why. It might be that God has another one. And I need to get on board with what that is. Isaiah 45, 7 says, uh, God says this, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, 
the Lord do all these things. Well, wait a minute, I thought it was the devil. I thought if I got a flat tire, that was a devil. I thought if I was being tested and my patience was thin, that's the devil. Sometimes it's you, the devil. <laughs> you know, 10 seconds before I have to come up and worship, pastor, I have a question. That's the devil. Where's the clicker? Oh, I forgot it in, in the office. That was the devil. You know, we give him a lot of credit. We give him way more credit than he deserves. It says here, I form the light and create darkness. By the way, by the way that's God. I make peace and create calamity. Well, that doesn't sound right. Well, read the Old Testament. You have all of these people that come in and they besiege Israel. Why? because God wanted to teach them a lesson because they were in sin and worshiping idols. So he took a worse nation and had them invade and took them captive for years. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, they came in and just ransacked them and the people were tortured and it was a terrible, terrible thing, horrible thing. Why did God allow this? God made this happen because his people were out of line and he let them go, if you would, instead of having a hedge of protection around them. It's God who caused that to happen. This business with the election? <gasps> Don't talk about that. It's political. <laughs> God is behind it. Because you know what's happening? The pressure and the heat of everything that's going on has caused corruption to come to the surface. And it's now evident for everyone to see that we're on the precipice of disaster. That democracy may be coming to an end if we don't fix this thing. The Lord says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. I just played the glad game with you. I was just trying to show you that God is doing something here, even in the midst of the calamity, that God brings it. And he brings to light those things that have been in the darkness for so long. In Acts 17, 26 to 28, and he has made of one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of our, your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring. Note the underlined section. And he determined their pre-appointed times. You were born not by accident. It doesn't matter what your parents were planning. You were not an accident. You were, poor, you were born in the, in the exact place and the exact time that God selected for you. That's what that means. So stop complaining. <laughs> Pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. He said, you're going to, that's it. You know, we have less boundaries now than anyone's ever had because we got planes, trains, and automobiles, right? God is the one that sets that up. He's the one that puts you in the neighborhood. He's the one that lets you have that neighbor. He's the one that gave you that coworker. He's the one that put you in New Jersey. So praise God. He put me here. So deal with it. Ephesians <laughs> 7, verses 13 to 14. Consider the work of God, for who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. That is not it. Oh, it's Ecclesiastes. I said Ephesians. I'm sorry. Consider the work of God, for who can make straight what he's made crooked? The answer is nobody. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. Okay, we could do that easily. But in the day of adversity, difficulty, hardship, consider. Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other. Hey God, this won't go far enough to pay my bills. How come? 
That's where we should be. Instead of looking at FICA and saying, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, FICA. <laughs> it's not the devil's fault. That's what it is to be in New Jersey, and God put you here, so don't complain. So, surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, and so realize when you complain, who you're complaining against. Complaining against God. Even my neighbor, who, who lets his dog just do things out there in, in large heaps and leaves it there, as the predominant wind is coming from their lawn. What a great opportunity to get involved with your neighbor and maybe share Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm playing the glad game again. Surely God has appointed one as well as the other. It also is based in God's love for you, which a lot of us have confused. Matthew 10, 29 to 39, Jesus says this, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, for you are more valuable than many sparrows. God knows the intimacies of every bird, and he has a time in which they will fall to the ground. Actually, they're, they're so cheap. They used to buy them for sacrifice, you know, doves, and they're cheap. And you can, get a couple of, you can get a couple of sparrows for cheap. In fact, you could lure them into your house if you got food. But God even knows about that sparrow. Do you think that you're less important or more important than the sparrow? But see, we don't understand God's love well enough to understand or realize in the time of difficulty that he's there with us, that our God is for us. And your very hairs of your head are numbered. Did you know that? Some of you have smaller numbers than others. <laughs> My number's getting lower and lower all the time. I got a solar panel developing. <laughs> and you know, we can complain about that. But it's a natural process of degradation and death because we live in sin. Sin has infected this world and you've got it. And yes, it's fatal. So, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Let's get to the passage. And we know. It's interesting. Do you know that? And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Do you know that? Scripture says we know. That should be your statement. We know this. What about Abraham? Do you think he knew something? It says here in Romans 4, 19 to 22, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old reproductively. He's 100 years old. He's not making babies anymore. That's what the scripture's saying. Not that, he, you know, you're worthless if you're old. He's saying that his body was done producing. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, because she was right behind him, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him as righteousness. We see Abraham as being the father of the righteous because he believed God, which is what we do when we get saved and we come to Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ was God's only son sent to die in my place to sacrifice himself for my sin so that I will live forever with God and I will be free from the bondage of sin in my life even as I live. Amen. It's believing. You see, Abraham is the father of all those who would believe. He believed, which means he knew God was gonna do what he said he's gonna do. There was no question. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Just that simple. And we know. What about David? Did he know these things? Did he know that God works all things together for good for those that love him, for the call according to his purpose? In Psalm 23, you guys know the Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want means I will have no desire that it is unrequited. That's important. In other words, I, I will go without need. 
because God's going to take care of me. Do you think God works all things together for good? Do you think David knew it? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. By the way, that's why God helps you to be good. It's not necessarily for you. It's for him first. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. We know that God works all things together for good. Even if I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, which means I'm going through a valley. By the way, a valley is a very, very dangerous place to be because strategically somebody could jump you and you got nowhere to go. Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, in other words, you're walking through this spooky valley and the sun is kind of behind you and you see this large, ominous shadow overshadowing you. And you know, he's right behind me. That's what that means. If I go through the valley, the shadow of death, I will not be afraid because you are with me. It doesn't matter if it's COVID that puts a, sh a shadow on you. It doesn't matter if it's the election puts a shadow on you. It doesn't matter if a doctor's report puts a shadow on you. It doesn't matter what the shadow is. You should be saying with David, I will not be afraid because you're with me. And you don't know where you're going, but you know whose hand you hold. And that's way more important than knowing where you're going. Amen? Do you see? Knowing that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. Do you know that? Are you convinced of it? In James 2.22, uh, talking about the working together, how is it that all things work together? It's like everything's in cahoots with everything else, that it all works together. Do you see the faith that was working together with his works, that by works, Faith was made perfect. James is talking about how every single person that had faith had works and how their works demonstrated their faith. We don't get saved before God because of the good things that we do if they don't come from right motives. But if we have a right motive, we love God and, and we want to do what he wants us to do, then the stuff that comes out of our life is a natural expression of our new nature. There should be some stuff coming out of your life. To say that you love God and then in your life you're showing that you disregard everything he says, then you're a hypocrite, you're a liar, says in 1 John. God works all things together for good. He works them together. This is the same word, actually. It's the same word that we get synchronized from. Everything is synchronized. That's what makes a watch work. All those little wheels, they're all synchronized. They all work with one another. That's how your car works. Everything's synchronized. You got... You got Pistons that are shooting off at exactly the right time to keep you moving forward. Synchronized, your heart, along with your lungs. They're in concert with one another. They're working together. And that's what God does with everything in your life. He works them together. It's hard to believe. It's easy to believe sitting here in a church service. It's easy when you have the scripture remembering, you know, uh, off the top of your head when you're trying to comfort someone who has just lost a loved one and is heartbroken. It is the most glib thing to come off somebody's lips. Well, God works all things together for, the, for good for those who love the Lord, who are the called according to his purpose. You got no reason to be sad. They're synchronous and they work out God's purpose. It doesn't mean that you don't have a heart. It doesn't mean that you don't recognize sorrow. Anyway, they work together. All of the things in your life, they work together. And I look back at my life and I think, why did I grow up in a poor family, a divorced couple with two younger brothers? And why was I exposed to the people I was exposed to? Because I ended up in drugs and criminal behavior and all that. Why, God, why? Why not put me in a nice home somewhere? Because I wouldn't give a rip about anybody hurting if I hadn't hurt first. I wouldn't care about anybody drug addicted if I wasn't drug addicted at some point. I wouldn't give a rip about somebody that's suffering if I haven't suffered. 
And that's God telling me how he works it together. He should be telling you the same thing. How does it work together? I almost picked up the phone and made some phone calls to some people, and I was going to ask them, how is it that this tragedy is working together for good? How is it that this difficulty, this thing that the world would label as, you know, or even the church sometimes as the devil, how is God using that and working it together for good? I, I didn't pick up the phone. I didn't want to bother anybody. But you know, people have testimonies of how this happens. I've got tons, but I won't bore you. Matthew 6, 25 to 34, Jesus says this, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Did you know worry is a sin? Worry is a sin. Because it says here, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? By the way, that's 18 inches. If I could add 18 inches, I'd look like Carl. <laughs> and I would not be overweight. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. In other words, they're not sitting on a, a sewing machine trying to make clothes for themselves. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry. By the way, he said that again, in case you didn't notice. Saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry. I just thought I'd let you know it's the third time he mentioned that. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. There are people that are so concerned about tomorrow that they forget about today. But you may not have a life tomorrow, and circumstances may be completely different tomorrow. There are people that you will run into today that you may never see again. I went to a memorial yesterday, and, and I've been thinking about these things. We can take each other for granted. We can take our own life for granted. And we can get worried about stuff and accumulating things and about a bigger house and a bigger car and, a, you know, more stuff. That's what I need, more stuff to cram into my little space. I bought it. Now what am I going to do with it? You know that, that feeling like, oh, it's going to be so great, and you get it and you go, I'm disappointed. Got a new iPhone and there's problems on it. Or I got a new this, I parked my new car in the parking lot and somebody parked next to me and dinged my car. I just bought new tires, I got a flat. It's always going to be something because if things are what you're focused on, you'll be very, very unhappy. If you're focused on God's kingdom and his righteousness, you won't have to worry about all that stuff. Not even your basic needs. In Deuteronomy 8, 15 to 18, God is telling us a little something. He is the one who led them through. And he says, who led you through the great and terrible witness, uh, wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water. Who brought water to you out of a flinty rock. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know. And this is why he did it that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. That was God's purpose in testing Israel. And of course, we know only two of them came out the other end. He did it to test them for their good. Did it ever occur to you that you might be going through a difficulty because God is testing you for your good? 
You know how patience is developed? By testing your patience all the time. You want to see if I'm a meek and humble man? Push me. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, Pastor Dave would never snap. He would never put me in a headlock and put me down. He'd never do that. I pray I wouldn't. But don't test me. <laughs> that he might humble you and that you might, he might test you for your good in the end. God's purposes in allowing difficulty in our life are to work all things together for good so that you might share in his holiness, the scripture says in another place. You think Joseph knew that it was for his good? Joseph, who was the, 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 the next to the youngest in the family, who was favored by his dad but hated by his brothers because God gave him dreams. And he showed him in the future that he's gonna be all that in a bag of chips. And his brothers, even his mother and father, are gonna bow down and show respect towards him. He's the, he's the kid. Nobody respects him. You guys know, the youngest in the family, unless it's a female, she gets protected. But like the youngest boy who's always getting into trouble, you know, it's get, get out of here, get out of here. That was Joseph, except God gave him some dreams and probably because he was young, he didn't have the wisdom to withhold these things and ponder them in his heart like Mary did when the angels came, when the, when the wise men came. She pondered them in her heart. She didn't broadcast it and tell everybody. He told them and then they hated him. And of course, they pick him up and they throw him in a well, an empty well. They wanted to kill him. One of the brothers prevailed and said, no, don't kill him, he's our brother. We don't wanna do that. So they took his coat and they soaked it in blood and they brought it to their father and said, hey, this looks familiar. Do you recognize this? And of course, his father wept. Jacob wept. My, my son has been killed. My favorite son, which is why you shouldn't have a favorite because it makes the others hate him. Anyway, parenting tip just thrown in there. Do you think Joseph knew it was for his good? It was for the good of the people? Do you think he understood it was God's good that he was working these things together for good? Well, one of them decides, let's pull him up and make some cash off him, sell him as a slave. They sold him to a slave and he ends up in Egypt. He goes to Egypt, he's bought by a guy named Potiphar, who's uh, like the number one bouncer for Pharaoh. He takes him home and Lo and behold, God blesses everything that Joseph does. Everything his hand touches, God blesses until he runs into a woman. That didn't sound good. <laughs> Potiphar's wife who wanted to. And he didn't want to do that. He says, listen, my master's given me everything except for you. Why would I take you? He's shown me honor beyond belief. Why would I take something from my master? I would never do that. He would sin against God. And he would sin against her and he would sin against his master and he'd sin against his own body. Why would I do that? She catches him one day, has all the servants released and grabs his coat in a way that he can't get away. So he takes his coat off and runs out naked. In the street, a good Jewish boy naked in the street. How do you know? Wait till Potiphar gets home. <laughs> they captured him, and Potiphar put him in jail when he should have put him in, you know, in the ground. Yeah. Because he knew what kind of wife he had. He knew what kind of servant he had. He puts him in jail, and now Joseph's in jail. He spends 17 years in jail. Yeah, they don't tell you that in the subtext, but it's there. 17 years. Hey, God, you gave me a dream. The stars, the sun and the moon bowed down to me. These stalks bowed down to me. I, I thought I knew what was going on, Lord. I thought that you were working in my life. I thought that we had a deal. Now he's in prison for 17 years. A couple of guys show up and he tells them what their dreams meant. And one guy's killed and one guy's released. And the guy that was released went back to Pharaoh. He said, listen, remember me when you come back before Pharaoh. He didn't. 
until Pharaoh had an agonizing dream. Gee, I wonder who gave him that. And the cupbearer says, oh, I totally forgot. There's a dude. I got, there's a dude. I, I know a guy. <laughs> but he's in jail. And so they go into jail and they clean him up and they bring him before Pharaoh. And he says, listen, I got a dream and uh, I'm, dis I'm distressed by it. I have the same dream all the time. He goes, well, what you had is two dreams. And he explained to them. This is what the dreams mean. You're going to have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine and the seven years of famine are going to eat up the seven years of plenty and you're in deep trouble. And then Pharaoh says, what do I do? <laughs> to the prisoner. He says, well, if I were you, I'd find a good manager. <laughs> and if I were you, I would build storehouses and gather the grain from the next seven years from the people and put it in storage so the next seven years you'll have. And he goes, I can't think of a better idea than that and I can't think of a better guy than you. And he makes him second in charge in all the kingdom. The guy who was in prison for 17 years. Do you think Joseph knew God was working all things together for good for those that love him, for the called according to his purpose? So as he's doing all this, his brothers come in during the famine. And of course, you know the story. It's a wonderful story in, in Genesis. He's reunited with his brothers. And they're all afraid now because they discover who he is. Now, he looks different after all this time. And he's probably wearing Egyptian makeup and he's got, you know, the clothes. He's now a man. He's not the boy that they threw, you know, to the, to the wolves. And Joseph does something very telling. He, he tells them who he is. He kind of researches their heart through a couple of trials. And he finds out where they're at. And he eventually reveals himself and he weeps on them. So glad to be reunited with them. This isn't a guy who was holding a grudge waiting to cut their heads off. This is a guy who had a relationship with God. And he did business with God. And what he says is so profound. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Joseph knew. Amen. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So who put me in jail for 17 years? God did. Because he was working some things behind the scene that Joseph couldn't have known. What a great example for us. For we know that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. They're called according to his purpose. Do you think Job knew that God works everything together for good? If you remember the story of Job, he lost everything. He had camels, he had donkeys, he had children. He had sons and daughters. And all of it was taken away in one day. And he had servants all one by one show up and tell him about the devastation to everything he owned. Job was a righteous man, and he loved God. In chapter 1, we're told, and then Job arose. He tore his robe and shaved his head, which means there's a place for mourning. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. He didn't complain. He didn't grumble against God. He didn't start to smack people. He worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong, which is what we do quite, quite regularly. Job knew that God was working it together, and it's his business. He's sovereign. Job understood this. Of course, he goes through this whole thing. There's seven days. He's got three friends that come and sit, and they say nothing, which is the best thing they could have done. And they sit in the dust with him, and they mourn for seven days. Those are some good friends. But then they made a grave mistake. They start to speak. And they all explain to Job he needs to work harder, he needs to be better. There's some sin in his life. There's something wrong with him because God would never let these things happen. They apparently went to a different kind of church that was a name it, claim it, 
you know, you should have everything and, and everything should be wonderful in your life because nothing difficult ever comes into your life unless you're doing something wrong, which is a lie. And God actually takes offense at this later on. Later on, after his friends tell him, you know, he needs to work harder, he needs to be better, there must be some hidden sin in his life, he's got some kind of secret second life going on, and he says, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. And he gets so sick and tired, mostly of his friends pointing their finger at him, that he says, I wish I were dead. I wish I was never born. I'm sick of this life. And I think it was more of his friends trying to help that made him that way. Because apparently all that stuff happened to him and he didn't curse God. Now all his friends are there telling him all the stuff he did wrong and it goes on for like 40 chapters. In chapter 42, God shows up and, or previously, and he says, I want you to stand like a man. Who is this that enters my council without n knowledge, without wisdom? And he goes, why don't you stand there? I'm going to question you. Were you there when I made everything? Were you there when I said the ocean's going to go this far, no further? Were you there? Were you there? Is, is this any of your business, really, is what he's saying? Job says this, and I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. That's what he knew about God. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Job says, you question me, I lost control of my face and I said things I shouldn't have said and I presume to understand things I don't understand. I'm sorry. Because I knew about you before, but now I see you. I have, I have an understanding that is much more than just a psychological recognition. I have an experience with you. And you know, when we go through difficult times, that is the bottom line. You end up having an experience with God through that. And he works those things together for good because it causes us to have a better relationship with him. It also sometimes causes our humility to have to come because we have to ask people for help. And who in the world wants to do that? That's on the bottom of my list. Try, try, try harder, try more. Ask for help? I mean, that's way in the bottom there. And yet God works in all these things. He works them together for good for those who are the called, for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. You think Jesus knew about these purposes which are worked together for good? He says here in John chapter 12, verses 27 to 28, he was in Jerusalem. He had wept over Jerusalem. He was in the city, and this is the week before he dies, and he knows what's going to go on, and in his mind, he's thinking toward that day because he's, he knows everything. And he says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Jesus, thinking out loud, says, you know, I know that I'm going to be hung on a cross and I'm going to die. And he told all his disciples at least three times before they got there. And they didn't get it. And he says, listen, the time's coming. And what am I going to say? I don't want to do this. I'm going to turn around and go back. That's the reason I came is to die. He knew that. Do you know the reason that you're alive is to die? You get to die to yourself. You get to die to your impulses. You get to die to your flesh. You get to die to your schedule and your plans and your imagination and your desires and your wants and your, your, you, you, you. And live for the Lord. It's the only way to have a really great life. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says that we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus kept his eyes on the prize, so to speak. And that's what we need to do. The rest of the scripture says that we should consider him who incurred such abuse from others so that we won't become discouraged in our hearts. Jesus knew who he was, why he was here, and it would mean his death. And he stood up and did it. By the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, you can do that too. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. So Pollyanna was right. God is involved in every single part of our lives, in every aspect. And if you are willing to pull back the veil of selfishness, you will see and God will tell you why he's doing the things that he's doing. Amen? Amen.